Uh, we are so proud to welcome to our podium Jean Dodaro, the Comptroller General of the United States, uh, who voiced support for the passage of the Data Act while it was still a proposal in Congress, uh, and who will be describing to us the opportunities for accountability that open data in spending will generate. And to introduce him, uh, we're grateful for support from Booz Allen Hamilton as a partner sponsor, and Bryce Pippert of Booz Allen Hamilton will introduce him. Please welcome them. Thanks, Hudson. Good afternoon. It's great to be with you all. Uh, the passage of the Data Act earlier this year was an important milestone. And the Data Act is linked to and a reflection of much broader th themes in society about the value of quality, consistent, transparent information. But now is the time to implement, to move forward with unlocking new government data sets for better analytics and better decision making. Booz Allen Hamilton is pleased to be a partner sponsor of Data Transparency 2014. I'm also very excited to be introducing our next speaker, who has had a career of dedicated public service and is a champion of government efficiency and effectiveness through strong support for transparency and consistency initiatives. He's extremely well suited for the conversations here at this conference. This year at Booz Allen, we're celebrating our 100th anniversary and a heritage of being partners with the government through changes and challenges. In recent years, We've helped our clients navigate legislative changes like Dodd-Frank, the Pension Protect Protection Act, the Affordable Care Act. The Data Act is another opportunity to not just comply, but step back and find opportunities for improving operational effectiveness and moving toward more data-driven analytical organizations. These types of transitions to improve government performance are at the heart of the mission of the Government Accountability Office and today's next speaker, the Comptroller General, Gene Dodaro. After graduating Lycoming College with a degree in accounting, he joined GAO as an entry-level auditor. He rose through the ranks, becoming the Chief Operating Officer in 1999. In 2008, Mr. Dodaro was appointed Acting Comptroller General, and in 2010, he was nominated to be Comptroller General and was confirmed by the Senate to a 15-year term. Mr. Dodaro has testified before Congress on numerous occasions on topics ranging from Iraq strategy to TARP implementation. Mr. Dodaro has been a strong advocate for transparency and the elimination of overlap and duplication in our federal government. Under his leadership at GAO, billions of dollars in cost savings and duplication have been identified. He was also a vocal champion of the Data Act as the legislation moved its way through Congress. Please join me in welcoming the 8th Comptroller General of the United States, Gene Dodaro. Thank you very much, Bryce. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today uh, to talk about this very important subject. I think we're on a threshold of a new era uh, in the federal government. Uh, if we seize the moment and the opportunity to implement this legislation correctly, uh, and deal with a lot of issues. I'd like uh, today to talk a little bit about GAO. Maybe some of you aren't familiar with our organization. Talk about the federal data transparency challenges and opportunities that we've seen over the years. You know, we uh, have a very fortunate and unique vantage point in the government in that we audit everything the federal government is involved in or thinking about doing. Uh, so we get to see the full spectrum of the federal government's activities and look across the panoramic uh, view that is our federal government. Uh, I want to talk about some related statutory requirements. I think it's not only about implementing the Data Act successfully. There are a lot of companion pieces of legislation that can have synergistic effects uh, with the Data Act if they're implemented in a proper package and, and manner over time and talk a little bit about you know, what, how we're looking at open data and enhancing GAO's own capabilities to carry out our important mission uh, for the Congress and the country. Uh, first, uh, we're an independent, nonpartisan agency. Uh, we're situated in the legislative branch of the government. Uh, we're independent uh, from a number of uh, standpoints, being in the ledge branch, auditing the executive branch agencies. Uh, we're independent in the sense of uh, I have one of the longest terms in the federal government, as Bryce mentioned, it's a 15-year tenure. 
uh, while you're appointed by the uh, president, confirmed by the Senate, can only be impeached by the Congress, can't be removed by the, by the president. Uh, so it ensures our independence over a period of time. Our job is to uh, advise the Congress in carrying out their constitutional responsibilities and help improve the performance and ensure the accountability of the federal government for the benefit of the American people. Uh, we serve virtually all the standing committees in the Congress and about two-thirds of the subcommittees uh, will request GAO work on a, on a fairly regular basis. So we get around 900 uh, to 1,000 requests from the Congress every year uh, that we respond to. Uh, well, our goals are to uh, help uh, the Congress. I think we maybe jumped ahead there. There we go. Uh, our goals are really to uh, root it in the Constitution in the sense that we want to help uh, the Congress meet the challenges to the financial security and the well-being of the American people to respond to global uh, challenges uh, that are in place that affect national security interests and also financial interests of the United States. We have a, a third goal, which is to transform the federal government to meet 21st century challenges, and it's in large part about the topic of today's uh, conversation uh, about the Data Act as one very powerful tool to uh, help this transformation take place. In terms of uh, work that we've done in the past, uh, we've seen a great need for increased, increased transparency in the federal government as we carry out our work. You know, we produce hundreds of reports each year uh, looking at various aspects of the federal government, and what we find is that there's very much a lack of consistent, reliable information uh, across the federal government's activities. You know, we've uh, audit, one of our responsibilities is to audit the consolidated financial statements of the federal government. Uh, and while there's been a lot of progress in that area, now virtually, you know, 23 to 24 departments and agencies can uh, receive uh, or do receive a uh, consolidated or a clean opinion on their financial statements. We've been unable to render an opinion on the consolidated financial statements of the federal government for three reasons. One is serious financial management problems at the Department of Defense, uh, where they have not uh, succeeded in any major part of the department passing the test of an audit, uh, but also because the Treasury Department can't eliminate uh, transactions among federal governments and agencies in a proper manner, uh, or compile the financial statements through Treasury's records that relate to the records of the individual agencies that are audited. So, uh, and then when we look at carrying out our other responsibilities, we often find a lack of reliable data at the agencies that we audit and difficulty in compiling uh, that information. This limits sharing also across the federal government uh, in terms of uh, decisions that are made, whether it be for eligibility purposes or sharing of information uh, to detect fraud, uh, waste, and abuse in federal programs. Uh, there's also uh, a very, it's very difficult to compare and first identify like programs across the federal government. Whether one of our other responsibilities is to produce an annual report for the Congress that identifies overlap, duplication, and fragmentation of federal programs. Uh, this turned out to be a very difficult job because of a lack of easily accessible information about A, what are it's a comprehensive list of federal programs or activities, there doesn't exist one uh, right now, uh, B, how much is spent on those programs and activities, what performance information those programs are generating, all that information is not readily available or reliable uh, in many cases, and so this really uh, made our job uh, much more difficult to be able to do this. We were still able to do it, but it you know, was, was very, very difficult, and in some cases, uh, not quite possible. Now, the Data Act responds to our belief that legislation was really needed to help address the situation. Legislation gives it permanence in that it'll transcend administrations. Uh, this, uh, as you can see from the 
uh, timeline in the Data Act, you will have a new administration in place to help implement it. And uh, my view is that, you know, successful management reforms in the federal government really need to have a legislative underpinning so they have permanence and consistency over time uh, and so they can, uh, no matter who's uh, in the White House or who's leading the individual departments and agencies, there's a requirement that these uh, data standards be implemented and effectively uh, used to help promote activities. Uh, we've also recommended that OMB take on a stronger and greater leadership role in this area, as well as the Treasury Department uh, and the Government Accountability and Transparency Board to develop long-term plans for implementing this successfully over time. Without sustained attention over time, you know, I advise the Congress, without legislation and sustained attention over time, this was not going to become a reality. Uh, and so I was very pleased to see the legislation passed. I'm pleased to see that the administration's taking up uh, this initiative and moving forward. But one of the things that I work on a lot at the GAO because of my tenure is to make sure that I do my part to make sure that things uh, occur uh, over time and they're sustained. So I'll be working not only in the short term, but you know, with whoever the next administration would be to help implement this properly over time. This next slide uh, shows some of the challenges that I think confront the Data Act going forward. This is our latest look at USAspending.gov. Now, most of you recall that legislation was passed in 2006. So we took a look at it lately and found, first of all, that there were 300 programs uh, representing uh, $619 billion federal assistance that weren't reported on USAspending.gov. It doesn't help to have a comprehensive site that's not comprehensive. Uh, you know, we need to have everything reported, so it needs to be complete. Uh, and uh, we made recommendations to make changes. Number two, it's uh, very important to increase transparency but the quality of the information has to be sufficient in order to make use of that transparency. If it's not reliable, it's really not going to be that beneficial, even though it might be transparent. It doesn't show exactly what's really going on. Well, so we checked the data on the website back to the agency records using a statistical sample that was projectable, and found only about 2 to 7 percent of the, of the cases did the data uh, in the website correspond to agency source records on that data. And so there, we made a lot of recommendations about uh, how to rectify this particular situation. You know, particularly we noted that the locations were, were different in terms of where the recipient was spending the money, which of course is an important part of people, what people want to track over time, the, uh, and the uh, description of exactly what the money was awarded for different. Uh, so we uh, recommended to uh, OMB uh, to uh, clarify its guidance, develop and implement and improve the oversight procedures. They've agreed and they're working to do this uh, consistent with actions they're taking to implement the Data Act. Now the Data Act, uh, I'm not going to go through, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this or have heard about it today, what all the requirements are, but I I, I want to emphasize to you, I mean, one of the reasons I was a strong vocal supporter of this is because of the data standards. There really were no data standards across the federal government. Without that, everything else uh, was uh, going to be very incremental progress at best uh, over time. And the, we also emphasized and recommended the consultative requirements here, both in the public and private sectors. We saw the benefits of this when we were monitoring the implementation of the Recovery Act uh, and how that led uh, to uh, successful uh, implementation. Actually, once the Recovery Act was passed, I actually received a, a letter that was sent to myself and then was uh, Peter Orzag was the director of OMB from the state uh, community. It was signed by state budget officers, state CIOs, state procurement people and others, and asking for a consultation process, which we helped establish and generate to uh, help work on the reporting requirements under the Recovery Act. And that process worked very well uh, over time. And so I think that needs to be replicated. Uh, 
Uh, I would point out uh, here, if you go back, uh, that uh, there's requirements for the IGs at the individual departments and agencies to do quality assessments of the information. Uh, GAO also has a role. Uh, our first report, though, is not due until 2017. You know, our job would be to look at how well uh, the IGs have done their reviews, as well as whether the agencies are following the standards. Uh, but we're going to start much earlier in the process. Uh, you know, I want to make sure that we're looking at the process that Treasury and OMB and others are using to actually establish the standards, that it follow good consultation processes, uh, was everybody's views aired and, and dealt with appropriately. The standards themselves, whether the standards are complete, going to be effective once implemented. I don't want to wait until this process is, is implemented to come in and audit it after the fact and find out that there are, are things that we believe can add value uh, to the process. So we're going to be involved uh, right from the beginning as this uh, legislation is rolled out. We'll also be working with the inspector general community to uh, work on common uh, audit procedures and practices so that we're not duplicating uh, any of the things that they may do. Now, the next couple slides talk about some of these companion pieces of legislation that I think are very important to consider as the Data Act is implemented because I think they have reinforcing objectives. The Government Performance and Results Act was originally passed in 1993. Uh, but it required strategic plans for departments and agencies and performance measures, but it was very much focused on individual departments and agencies. In 2010, there was a big modernization effort to the Government Performance and Results Act that requires now cross-cutting goals and objectives, requires more agencies to work together to consult with one another, because a lot more solutions now to government problems require multiple agencies to be involved. So it set a whole new paradigm uh, for uh, federal government accountability, required a public reporting website on how well agencies were implementing their performance measures and made them more visible. And of course, the Data Act can feed and will feed some of the performance measures of the federal government uh, over time if properly integrated. Uh, as, as we go forward as a country. And so uh, I think this act also uh, was important because it required OMB to publish an inventory of federal programs. So far, OMB started out to do this in an incremental basis with the largest 24 departments and the agencies. But it gave great flexibility to the individual departments and agencies to come up how they defined the program. Some did it according to the budget structure, others did it according to who the, the uh, end users were, and there were a wide variety of means. So it has very limited uh, utility in being able to compare programs across departments and agencies. Uh, and we recommend that OMB take another look at that area, which uh, hopefully they will be doing in conjunction with implementing uh, the Data Act uh, over a period of time, plus they need to bring in the rest of the federal government outside the largest 24 departments and agencies. Next uh, uh, related statutory requirement is the Improper Payments Elimination Act. Actually, when we first started doing audits of departments and agencies across the federal government, nobody was measuring improper payments at all. And when we did the first audit in the Medicare uh, uh, program of HHS, GAO was working with the IGs, the, actually the auditors, we did an estimate of improper payments in the Medicare program and then recommended that the federal departments and agencies should be doing this as part of their management responsibilities. And then Congress passed a series of laws that have increasingly required the measurement of improper payments. The current estimate, by the way, just so you know, is over $100 billion annually. Uh, that go out in improper payments. These are payments to people who aren't eligible in the wrong amounts, maybe overpayment, maybe underpayment, uh, maybe lack of documentation to say the payment was uh, well supported by documentation. It's a big issue. And in times where our federal government's on an unsustainable long-term fiscal path, we have to make every dollar count. And $100 billion is really not 
uh, in, in improper payments. And we've reported that estimate's not even complete. There are a number of programs like the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families that's not even making an estimate yet. Uh, so, but, uh, so this act also helps because it focuses again on transparency, on measurement, and on using uh, tools and techniques and data analytics uh, to help solve problems in the federal government. Uh, we've also been coordinating with the Recovery and Accountability Transparency Board and the Inspector Generals across government to uh, identify obstacles and barriers to sharing of information by the audit and oversight communities, and there are a lot of barriers there. Uh, and so we've set up, uh, on the next slide, uh, we've talked about, you know, we've set up a, a uh, uh, a working group. We've got a, a community of practice uh, in this area now, which anybody's free uh, to join. At the end of the, my remarks, I'll introduce a couple of GAO people uh, that are here who, who you can talk to more about some of these areas. Uh, and it's to identify legal and other barriers, to share new tools for data analytics and data sharing across the government. Right now, we've, we have a number of people, both from federal, state, and local communities, as well as the private sector that are involved in the community of practice. Uh, the website's noted here on the slides. Uh, in the interest of time, on the, we'll skip the next slide. This just shows the uh, uh, amount of improper payments. There are 70-some programs across the federal government. These are the top 10 uh, where there are improper payments. So it's not an isolated problem. It's a pervasive problem across the federal government. Um, in terms of the, the GAO, I'll go to the last slide and then have time for questions. Uh, you know, we are very much trying to focus on additional opportunities that we can exploit in GAO of leveraging o o open data. Because if the data is more organized uh, and transparent and much more reliable, we will free up a considerable amount of resources that otherwise we've had to go into the agencies. Every time we have to do an audit, we have to go in and test the reliability of the data that we're using to do the audit because there aren't real good procedures in place to ensure the integrity of the information. This takes a lot of time and effort. We also have access to a lot of information that other people won't have access to because of uh, confidentiality and other special provisions. So if we can leverage the new open data with the other information that we have, it will create a very uh, powerful ability uh, to begin to use that information to detect areas in need of improvement or further scrutiny and audit. So we're very excited about the uh, opportunity uh, to do this. It will change how we do our work uh, at the GAO, I think, very profoundly if the act is implemented uh, properly. Uh, over time, which is one of the reasons, among others, that I'm you know, investing a lot of time to make sure that it does get implemented uh, properly over a period of time. So you can uh, uh, count on GAO to be involved uh, in this area on a sustained basis. My term goes to 2025. Uh, so uh, if we can't get it done by then, uh, we're going to have a big problem. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. I'd be Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Gene. Obviously, uh, GAO has a unique perspective across the federal government and, um, and an important role as the Data Act gets rolled out. I'm wondering if you have thoughts on other low-hanging fruit or places where open data and data transparency could be further expanded in the future for the federal government to enhance how you're able to assess performance in the GAO? Well, I, I think there are a number of uh, opportunities to be able to do this. I, I think the best examples is what the Recovery and Accountability Transparency um, uh, Board did uh, with their data that they collected. Uh, first of all, you know, they there was a lot of concern, as most of you recall, the Recovery Act, there was over $800 billion being spent in a relatively short period of time. And there were a lot of concerns about potential fraud uh, in that area. And they set up a number of indicators that used sort of geo-tracking information 
uh, data on where the awards were going to spot potential uh, problems and fraud ahead of time. One of the things that this uh, act, if properly implemented again, uh, can do is to help prevent improper payments and prevent fraud up front. And one of the things, is, as, as an old auditor, I can tell you, is that you, you, know, you can identify problems later, but you don't recover very much of the money that you lost. So you really need to try to stop it in the first place and prevent those payments. So th this, I think, can be a real boon to the federal government and a real protection to the taxpayer. Great. Thanks. Any questions from the audience? Thank you, Gene. Uh, the question I have is this. Uh, you acknowledged that um, or described that OMB had problems implementing the GPRA Implement, uh, Improvement Act requirement to define the programs. But you also had a slide up there that showed that in uh, looking at the accuracy of the data on uh, recovery, not recovery, on spending.gov, you identified 300 assistance programs that had problems. So I guess my question is this. Um, does GAO have a way of defining programs that would be helpful to OMB as they have to do their job? And if so, how could you share that with uh, OMB? Well, Hal, we, we've given them uh, you know, our perspectives on how to go about doing this, and we're about ready to issue a report with more recommendations to them to help address this issue. So we are providing help where we need, but we believe that the, the, uh, the managers and the executive branch are really the ones that need to define the inventory. I mean, we're helping where we can and where it makes sense, but I, I don't think, I mean, if we're in a situation where the auditors have to define all the programs, it's really not uh, a good way to manage uh, the activities in the federal government. Uh, but I, you know, we are helping where we can, but they need to accept responsibility and, and, and to do this in a way that you can do comparisons across the federal government. And this is difficult. I think this is the area they're struggling with the most. They can have each agency say what they think their programs are, but like when we were doing overlap and duplication work, we identified, you know, 82 programs that provided teacher quality training in 10 different federal agencies. Nobody had a complete list of those programs until we went in and tried to ferret them out, and it takes a lot of time. There were 209 STEM programs to improve STEM. Nobody had a comprehensive inventory. So, you know, to be able to look across the federal government, you need to have cons some consistency. And that's why I think the implementation of trying to come up with data standards and data requirements is really, really important for them to do. Thank you. Um, my name is Catherine Eisen. I'm with Citizen, and my question is about data quality. So we know that the Data Act has a requirement for each agency's inspector general to report into the GAO, the first of three, I think in 2017. And um, you also talked about how you've been working with inspector generals to ensure that you're not uh, duplicating existing processes. But my question is, how might you improve on some of the existing um, data quality or data management and oversight processes, um, both to close some of the current gaps that you talked about and some of the current problems, but also to be ready for uh, these future reports and requirements that are going to be coming in the next couple of years? All right. Well, on data quality, I'd say you know, th three things. One, that it's primarily needs, the management needs to accept some responsibility on ensuring data quality. Number one, it's not just an auditor responsibility. Uh, GPRA and the Data Act make that both clear that the agencies in posting information are supposed to attest to the reliability of the information. Uh, secondly, there are ways, as you point out, to leverage existing uh, oversight mechanisms to make sure and through the annual financial audit process is one way. You know, we've, we've had discussions with OMB about attaching a a schedule of federal award information that can be audited by the auditors uh, and, and eventually do that. So I think there are ways to use the mechanisms in place to be able to do it. And then thirdly, there needs to be follow-up you know, and actually implement the recommendations that the auditors make. 
uh, to improve these act, uh, the reliability of the information. Uh, too often, the, we point out problems, and they're really not solved on a long-term basis uh, over time. But uh, data quality is going to be pivotal. We can make all of the information in the world available, but if it's not reliable, it's not going to be very helpful. I think we've got time for just one more question. Any others from the audience? Okay. Just, uh, probably excuse sure. me for a second. Yeah. If I could ask, uh, Jim Sweetman is here. He, he done, has done a lot of our work on usaspending.gov uh, and an, on the Data Act. And so if you have any further questions, you can talk to him at the rest of the day. Uh, Joanna Ayanata is here. She's heading up our community of practice. If any of you are interested in the data sharing, data analytics area, and we have Naba Barker-Cardi here, who's our uh, chief technologist at GAO. He can answer any question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so thank you all very much. Well, Gene, thank you very much. Many thanks to the Comptroller General. Uh, we're going to break now, but I'd like to ask the folks that are uh, to my right, what do you call it, house left? If you have stuff, you may want to move it because we are about to close one of the two massive movable walls of this hotel uh, ballroom in order uh, to start preparing for our breakouts. But before we go into the breakouts at 3 p.m., uh, we'll be exploring open data in the states and municipalities, so be back 3 p.m. sharp for that. For now, have some coffee.